thank you. If this topic were easy, we wouldn't need to be here. Uh, this is extraordinarily difficult. As I said a few moments ago, one issue is responding to the problem. People who need medical care, uh, we as doctors respond. But dealing overall with the issue, dealing with the issue of preventing the need uh, is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, we know that armed conflict it has detrimental effects on the whole population, not just the individuals who are directly harmed. Uh, it has detrimental effects on the social determinants of health, and of course it has effects on other countries, as Turkey can testify. My twin message is that I'll say it for a third time, uh, we have responsibility to the people who need medical help. And the fact of armed conflict uh, is not a reason to suspend all the other important things that people need to improve their health and well-being. Life has to go on, and the issue of dealing with the circumstances in people's lives that affect their health has to continue. This is the conceptual framework that we had for our European review of social determinants of health and the health divide. We look at people's stages of the life course, the wider society, the macro level context and systems, including health systems. And of course, when conflict supervenes, that's at the heart of all of this. It makes it harder to address the life course stages. It has impacts on the wider society. Uh, it is affected by and affects the macro level context. And it interferes with health systems. Uh, I was just looking at the report that the Turkish Medical Association has done on the fact that um, conflict, the refugee crisis, is making it harder for medical personnel to carry out their normal functions. So conflict makes all of this worse. The drivers of migration title of our meeting, War Migration. The drivers are armed conflict, major natural events, continued unrelenting poverty and oppression. The clear dividing line that some people would like to make between economic migrants and political refugees is not a clear dividing line. Uh, one way or t'other, when people cannot feed their families, go on about their business, whether you call that being an economic migrant or a political refugee is to some extent part of political preconceptions. But people moving from places of relative lack of safety towards the relative safety, I mean the whole concept of human security goes much deeper than simply physical security. It's psychological security, economic security, social security, as well as physical integrity. Where do the world's refugees come from? Syria, unfortunately, now dominates the situation in terms of where refugees come from. Then Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, Sudan, Congo, but you can see these extreme conflict situations. With my colleagues in London at the Institute of Health Equity, we've been doing work with the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office of the World Health Organization. Of the 22 member states of the Eastern Mediterranean region, at any one time, half have violent conflict. And it's simply not the case that they can stop action on improving people's lives, the social determinants of health, or delivering medical care. 
and major refugee hosting countries, Turkey, number one. Then Pakistan. So we need to continue with the need for sustainable, de sustainable development and healthy lives and well-being for all. The new sustainable development goals, the 17 goals that the UN General Assembly has endorsed, and will be the framework for much of what countries do in monitoring over the coming 15 years up to 2030. Um, thinking about social determinants of health, two goals are particularly important. SDG 3, which is on health, um, good health and well-being, and SDG 10, which is explicitly on poverty and inequality. And they're both, of course, highly relevant to conflict situations. The WHO Commission report, the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, we put right at the center of what we were trying to do, social justice. And in this situation, social justice applies both to Syria, Afghanistan, the countries from which migrants are coming, and to the treatment of migrants in the host countries. Social justice, an important principle. We talk about empowerment, material, psychosocial and political, and creating the conditions for people to have control over their lives. I can think of no situation that more deprives people of control over their lives than finding yourself unable to live in your country of origin and in a set of difficult circumstances in the host country or trying to get from one to the other. And we had three principles of action, improve the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age, tackle the inequitable distribution of power, money and resources, and measure and understand the problem, evaluate action, expand knowledge base, develop the workforce. And I think all of those apply to the issue of migration and health and war. In our English review, translating this into specific actions, we had six domains of recommendations give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all, minimum income for healthy living. People need the minimum, at least, necessary for a healthy life, healthy and sustainable places to live and work, and strengthen the role and impact of ill health prevention. All of these apply to the situation of migrants and indeed to the situation in their home countries. Thinking about children, I ask the question, are we going to say that the children who are caught up in this conflict, I don't only mean the ones who are found washed up dead on the beaches, but the children who are the children of migrants who are not going to school who are not being treated the same way that other children are being treated, they will be a lost generation. Children need a safe environment, a decent standard of living, parenting and family support, preschool education and care, and of course primary, secondary and tertiary education. Looking at inequities in early childhood, this is stunting in the first year of life, low growth in a number of countries, Nepal, India, Bangladesh, looking at the richest and poorest and the average, and you can see in country after country, poorer children, slow growth in the first year of life. This is going to of be affecting the children in Syria and Afghanistan, and it's going to be affecting 
the children of forced migrants in Turkey in the host countries. We look beyond simply growth to good development. Our understanding is that what children need is not just physical growth, but psychological and cognitive development, social, emotional, and behavioral development. And in a country like Britain, these data are from Britain, we look at the level of deprivation of a local authority in a rich country that happily has no conflict. And what we see looking at the low end, the more deprived the local authority, the worse the social development, the smaller the proportion of children age five who are classified as having a good level of development on psychological and cognitive development, social, emotional, and behavioral development. The more affluent, the better. And if we can see that effect in a rich country that's stable, you can imagine what's going on in a poorer country that's unstable, marked by conflict. And we know a lot of the drivers of poor development. This is now looking at children age seven, uh, reading and maths, low birth weight, not being breastfed, maternal depression, having a lone parent, low family income, parental unemployment, low maternal qualifications, damp housing, social housing, area deprivation. The more of those present, the lower the scores on reading and maths. Now these are data that we have from the UK, but you can see how they would apply to children living in uncertain circumstances. Fair employment and good working conditions. We want work to provide financial security, paid holidays, social protection. These must feel like they come from another planet when people are living in uncertain circumstances, worried for their very lives. If we look at youth unemployment by region, in North Africa, for example, the one at the top, youth unemployment uh, overall is running at around a quarter, over 25%. Youth unemployment at over 25%, we know in Greece, official figures for youth unemployment have been 60%. In Spain and Italy and Portugal, it's been higher than 40%. I say official figures, there's no doubt some of those people are working informally, but having figures up at around that level blight a whole generation. And thinking coming back, because we don't have the data on informal migrants, but I'm applying what we know from more settled situation to the situation of people in very unsettled situation, either in the country of origin or in the host country, young people with nothing to do. It blights their lives, they get up to mischief, they are ready recruits for terrorist organizations, for civil unrest. Uh, we know that if you reduce youth unemployment, civil unrest goes down. When young people have something meaningful to do, they don't get involved in mischief or worse. And we see this, social unrest by youth unemployment from different countries. The higher the youth unemployment, the higher the degree of social unrest. So youth unemployment isn't just something that people like me who are concerned with social determinants of health worry about. We should be worried about youth unemployment because it leads to social unrest. And then we have the informal sector, the percent of young and adult workers in the informal economy in selected countries. There's Turkey, 
according to these figures, nearly 60% of young people are in the informal sector and 44% of adults in the informal sector. Quite apart from how you have a tax base and collect taxation to provide for social and health services when so many people are in the informal sector. That's difficult. But we know the standards of work, of occupational health conditions are far worse when people are in the informal sector. And we need a healthy civil society. And I would say that the Turkish Medical Association is a clear example of civil society organization. It's independent of government, as it should be. Uh, it is a civil society organization. Uh, but we need not just a medical association, we need intersectoral activity. As I said in my opening remarks, if people are homeless, we need to treat their illnesses and we need to deal with the fact of their homelessness. And that means intersectoral activity, building health and social systems, and we need long-term sustainability. And we need to promote health as a message of peace. I've heard politicians say, if we treat political refugees well, if we treat migrants well, that will only encourage others to come. I can think of no more immoral statement. The idea that we should treat individuals as instruments of a political policy goes against everything we believe in. We believe in treating each individual with dignity. That's at the core of our ethical principles. To treat people as individuals with dignity, not as instruments for political policy. And we as doctors can show the way forward by taking a strong moral stand at treating the illness of people in need and trying to address the conditions that led to their being in need. Only then, by showing a moral way forward, can we contribute to a world where social justice is taken seriously. <laughs>